Stand with me one more time, please. We're going to lo- read from Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. This is the word of the Lord for us today. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to, te- uh, to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of the religious law complain uh, that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others uh, in the wilderness and go to search for the one uh, that is lost until he finds it? And when uh, he has found it, uh, he would joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together all his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents uh, and returns to God than uh, over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. God, we thank you for the reading of your word today. And Lord, we do ask that you would bless this reading. Father, I ask that you would help me today, that Father, the words that are said are yours and not just my own. And God, that you would help us draw closer to you in every way. We love you, Lord. Your son's name. Amen. You may be seated. It's good to be back in Gladewater. We had an awesome time in Indianapolis a couple weeks ago. Uh, Thank you all for letting us uh, go away for uh, a week or so for that. Uh, We had an awesome time uh, at the uh, General Convention uh, and the Global Assembly of the Church of the Nazarene. Uh, Sunday morning, there were 12,000, 15,000 people that gathered in Indianapolis. 12,000 to 15,000 Nazarenes in one place. Amen? Let's just say the restaurants were full at supper time. Amen? Y'all didn't get that. Uh, We like to eat. Amen. Amen. The Nazarene motto, if you feed them, they will come, right? Most of the time. Man, is everybody awake today? Amen. Wave at at me if you're awake. If you're not awake, wave at me. Amen. Thank you, Tommy. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. We had a great time. And so uh, I'm excited to be back, though. I wrote this sermon three weeks ago, uh, and I've been itching to preach it ever since. Uh, And so um, the Lord just made me wait one more week. That's okay. Had a few more things I had to add in, okay? So I'm up to seven pages today, all right? Page an hour, we should be good, all right? Amen? Amen? Just play. Relax. Just play. Uh, over the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at the lost parables in uh, Luke chapter 15. And by understanding God's heart for sinners and for bringing the lost to him, we can celebrate salvation and conversion with generous and joyful hearts. If there's one thing that I have learned uh, since my pastoral journey, but I would argue even before my ministry journey since becoming a Christian, a Christ follower, uh, is that the journey is exactly that. It is a journey, right? That our walk with Christ is a journey. Our walk with the people around us is also a journey, right? We can only put one one foot in front of the other, right? Right? God only gave us two feet. Sometimes we want to go faster than that. Uh, certain situations in life. Man, that, that 12-hour drive from uh, Gladewater to Indianapolis with two kids under 10, God is good, amen? That was a long drive, long drive. We stopped about seven hours into it, rested for a little while, and then finished driving the next day. It was a journey, right? And we learned a lot about each other in that journey. Uh, 12 hours in a car, hopefully you learn something about somebody, right? Uh, This journey that we're all on, us as Christ followers, the people that we bring along with us, it's truly a journey. But sometimes we want to rush other people to Christ. Sometimes we want to take this friend that's just not doing well, and and we want to push him to know Jesus, and sometimes we can push him away from Jesus in doing so. Uh, and sometimes we can, we can batter them and bruise them with Scripture, because that's sometimes what we do is batter and bruise people with Scripture rather than loving them. Amen? Amen? And we know the difference in that, because we can justify Scripture all day long until we really know the meaning of it. It's something totally different. But sometimes we can batter and bruise people with Scripture and push them further away rather than loving them and helping them draw closer uh, to Christ. And so this, this journey that we're on truly truly is uh, a journey. And I'm telling you that I've experienced this mercy and this grace of God in this journey that I've been on these last 
20, 25 years of my life. Amen? Those of you that have that relationship with Christ understand even more so the, the, the grace and the mercy that you have experienced in your, in your journey with Christ. So today we're going to talk about the impact that walking with people on life's journey, the impact that that can have in people's lives. Because we can do one of two things. We can, as we're walking along somebody or walking with somebody in this journey, we can either one, push them away, or we can two, bring them closer, right? We can one, push them away, or we can two, bring them uh, closer. Referring back to our scripture here in Luke chapter 15, the first seven verses, it's safe to assume that this conversation that Jesus is having with these people is taking place around a table. How do I know that? Because the phrase, even eating with them, is used, right? And so this, this phrase, even eating with them, implies that Jesus is sitting down at a table with these tax collectors and notorious sinners, do you like the way Luke kind of throws that descriptive word in there? Not just sinners, but notorious sinners, right? It's not just Charlie, but it's Charlie, right? See how that puts a different meaning on that, right? Uh, and so it's not just tax collectors and sinners, but notorious, notorious sinners. Uh, it's sad today that many Christians have limited who they associate with outside the church. I'll be honest with you, to me that's a sad thing. What do I mean by that? We've, we've created almost an exclusivity for church rather than opening the church up and truly allowing those that need it to come in. Uh, we have put barriers up in our church in some ways that have prevented those that actually need it to come in. And in doing so, what have we done? We've pushed more and more people away from church rather than trying to help them. In doing so, we've pushed them away in their journey with Christ rather than trying to help them Bring in. And, and you may know what I mean by this. Sometimes, and you've heard this before, I know you have, don't go down that street, right? Welcome to our community. Don't go down that street, though, right? Um, welcome to our community. Just don't go to that restaurant, right? Um, welcome to our community. Don't talk with those people. Whoever that area, whatever that is, or whoever those are, and somebody popped in your mind as soon as I said that. I know they did because we're human beings and we're fallible creatures. Amen? Right? And so when I said that, there's a street that popped up. When a church that I was serving at before, that was one of the people who told me. They said, well, we, we love these people, but we recommend you not going down that street. That broke my heart because those people need Jesus just as much as you do. Amen? Those kids down that street need to know Jesus just as much as, as I do. Amen? Uh. It's, it's, it's great that you're here, and we're, we're glad that you want to support our community, but this restaurant, there's some of those people that hang out at that restaurant, so you may not want to, you may want, you may not want to go to that restaurant, right? Uh, it's sad because when we do that, again, we're creating barriers. We're creating these things that are keeping people away from Christ rather than bringing them, uh, bringing them in. Early on in my ministry, I was very concerned about my image, not how I looked, obviously. I mean, look at me, right? Uh, but what other people who what other people saw uh, me as, or how other people saw me as as a pastor? So uh, my first ministry, first uh, full time ministry position was youth pastor in Marksville, Louisiana, and there was a community event going on, and the pastor was sick and he wasn't able to attend the event, and so he said, Charlie, can you would you mind going and representing our church at this event? I said, Sure, I'll do it. Where is it at? It's at the casino. Yeah. And Marksville, guess what's in Marksville? The casino. That's it. And there's a Walmart. There's a Wendy's they just built. And if you've never just had a, a freshly built Wendy's, the food that's there, outstanding. So next time you want Wendy's, go to the newest one built, and that's the best food. I promise. Great. Chicken sandwiches you can't beat. They're Frosties. Praise Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know they got a cherry frosting or strawberry frosting now? That's good. I digress. So anyways... So we're in Marksville, and the pastor says it's at the casino. Again, growing up, I didn't go into the casino. My parents didn't go to the casino. The people that I knew didn't go to the casino. We didn't even go there to eat. I know they got great food. I've heard they had great food, right? Their uh, unlimited uh, crab legs or whatever it is that they have sometimes, uh, crawfish, whatever it is, depending on what season's going on. That's great. I, I've just never, I've never been a part of that. Not judging anybody that has. 
I mean, good food is good food, amen? I don't care where it's at, right? Amen? I mean, come on now. Uh, and so, uh, so he asked me to go to the casino, and, 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 and so I, I'm like, I'll, I'm already frazzled, right? And so I throw on a shirt, and it's halfway buttoned, and, and I put my pants on, and I get my shoes and all this other stuff, and I get in my truck, and I go to the casino, and I'm already, like I said, shaking up. And so I walk in, and, and, and I'm hearing noises I've never heard before, right? And I'm smelling stuff that's not appealing. All this other stuff is going on, and I get there, and I go to the front, and I said, where's, where's this community event at she says oh it's in the back of the casino uh in our ballroom like well dad gum now i gotta go through the whole casino right and so i'm walking with my head down one because i don't want people to see me and i'm hoping i don't see anybody from the church there amen right so that way they can't say oh our associate pastor anyway so uh, so I'm, I'm walking through the casino with my head down and i get to the to the point where you know the the if you've ever been into a casino before there's a point that they won't let you pass unless you can show your id I got to that point. She said, sir, I need to see your ID before I can let you into this event. So I start, I said, yes, ma'am. So I start, I was so frazzled, I left my wallet at the house. Left my wallet at the house. I get back in my truck and I called Sierra. I said, well, I'm not going to this event. She said, why? I said, because I don't have my wallet. She said, just come back and get it. I said, nope, I'm already freaked out enough. I'm coming home. So I come home, get back in my pajamas, whatever it is I was doing. And I didn't go back to the event. Why? Because I was so focused on how other people saw me that I wasn't able to accomplish what it is I had even set out to do in the first place. We do that all the time. We're so focused on uh, when we help somebody or when we're talking with somebody. Sometimes we can get so focused on how other people perceive that conversation that maybe we just, the conversation is wrecked. Or, or maybe we just don't even go to that person in the first place because we've psyched ourselves out so much. Right? Here Jesus is. Listen to this. We get a whole different outlook on how the church is supposed to operate and respond to these people in Luke chapter 15. Luke begins writing uh, that uh, the, the, the people that Jesus was with were tax collectors. And we talked about this a while back. These tax collectors were thought to be the scum of the earth because it was the, the people, the, the Jewish people, that have turned against their beliefs to work to the Roman government. How dare they? Right? It's like working for the IRS now, right? Just playing. It's not like that. you got to have a job. Anyways, so it's, it's these people that have turned against their own it, as what they looked at it as, and so they were considered traitors and the scum of the earth. And then other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. Amen? Uh, sinners here is this general term that is referring to literally all who were marginalized. Actual sinners, yes, but those that the Pharisees themselves and the religious teachers deemed unworthy for whatever region or for whatever reason. The marginalized were the ones who sought Jesus and listened to him often. Amen? That's a key scripture there. It wasn't the religious teachers that sought Jesus' teachings. It wasn't the Pharisees. It wasn't the, the disciples for that matter. The scripture says it was the sinners and the tax collectors who often came to Jesus' table to what? Just to listen to him talk. Amen? Just to listen to him talk. A few paragraphs, uh, the last few paragraphs in Luke chapter 14, we see Jesus is talking about the cost of discipleship. And he ends by saying this, whoever has ears to hear, what? Let them hear. What were these tax collectors and notorious sinners doing? They were hearing. Not only that, they were probably listening too. Amen? Because we know there's a big difference between hearing and, and listening. This is exactly what these marginalized people were doing, or at least attempting to do anyways. The Pharisees and the religious teachers began grumbling and murmuring and complaining that Jesus was associating himself with those types of people. Even eating with them. Here, the word that Luke uses to describe the Pharisees and religious teachers is the same word used in Exodus when the Israelites complained and grumbled against Moses, God's chosen prophet. Now listen to this. What's sad is that the Pharisees and religious teachers are so focused on who Jesus is talking to and associating himself with rather than what he was teaching them. How sad is that? How sad is that? 
The religious teachers and the Pharisees were so concerned about the people that Jesus was associating with, they could care less exactly what, they, what he was talking about, even though what he was talking about would literally change their life. Amen? Would literally change their life. The Pharisees, if they would just quit being so dadgum prideful, amen, get past themselves and actually hear what Jesus is saying. Early in our relationship, I was a very overprotective boyfriend. Mine and Sierra, by the way, in case you didn't know who I was talking about. I guess I needed to clarify that, amen. I was very protective and now my wife in our relationship. Um, I graduated two years earlier than she did. I know, I know. And so, uh, but I picked her up from school and I also dropped her off at school, right? That's back when I didn't want to work, amen? <laughs> amen? I decided to go to college. I put that in quotation marks. Anyways, so, uh, so I'd drop her off at school and then I'd pick her up, right? I was super overprotective. I was crazy about it. She'd come walking out of the, out of the, out of the school and I'd see she'd have some friends with her and I'd say, who are you with? Who are those people? Who is that guy? Right? Who is that girl? Right? I was that person. How sad is that? Right? I don't care what she was talking about. They could have been talking about the game that was going to take place later on that day. They could have been talking about the TV show that they watched last night. I don't know. I was more concerned about who she was talking to rather than what they were talking about. Man, I had to get over that. Amen? I had to get over that quick. Uh, because that started to spill out into some of my other relationships. I told y'all I used to be a very judgmental person. I really was. As a Christian early on, I, I was very legalistic in my upbringing. You don't do this, you don't do that, right? And that spilled out into my other relationships with people. Well, why were you talking to those people? You say you're a Christian. Why were you doing that thing, right? Why were you at that restaurant? Right? Can I get an amen? Uh, am I the only one that's been that way? I, I was super, super that way for a while. And it took me a while to understand. And, 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 and you read these scriptures. Jesus was, Jesus was not always in church. Amen? As a matter of fact, if you go back and read the Gospels, rarely was he in church. What did he do most of his teaching? He did most of his teaching in the streets. Most of his teaching in those restaurants. Most of his teaching to those kind of people. Right? And so it took me a while to realize to be more like Jesus, I got to look more like Jesus and be more like Jesus. And so I, I had to ask forgiveness for that. Lord, I'm sorry. I had to go to Sierra and say, I'm sorry for being a stupid boyfriend. Right? Amen? That's what it was. I was just being stupid, if I can say that word. Jesus is showing us that the table, now listen to this. You're not, fix, not going to like the word I'm fixing to say, but this is what Jesus is telling us. The table is inclusive. Listen to me before you start getting mad at me, okay? Because I know that's a dangerous word right now. Inclusive. Jesus did come to the earth to die for who? Everybody. No matter what lifestyle they're living, Jesus still died for them. Now, it's up, it's up to us to recognize that and accept our sin and say, Lord, forgive me of my sin, right? Amen? But these tax collectors and these notorious sinners... Whatever you're thinking of, whoever you're thinking of, man, Jesus said, come. Be a part of what I'm doing. Amen? Now, again, we've taken that word in the Christian uh, inclusivity and all this stuff like that. Ah, oh, we got to accept this. We got to accept that. No, but we do have to love them. Amen? Amen? Amen. You have to love those people, those individuals. Might not like the sin, but man, I sure hope we love the sinner. Amen? I mean, because that's what Jesus says, the only reason he died on this earth. He didn't like the sin that people were doing, but man, he sure did love the sinner. So he said, I'm going to give up everything so that this person can have an opportunity at a new life. Amen? And he invites them to his table. When we have communion, every single time I read that, we come to this, his table. Amen? His table, not ours. The, 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 the table of Christ, we don't get to pick and choose who comes to that table. Amen? We don't get to pick and choose who comes to that table. But Jesus says, man, if you come and sit down and be a part of what's going on, there's something so good that you're going to hear and that you're going to receive. And so Jesus here was showing this table is a symbol of inclusivity. Jesus' fellowship with disreputable characters is warm and friendly, not hostile and judgmental. 
Jesus hearing the grumbling and murmuring then shares several life-changing parables. And I'm just now halfway through my sermon, so y'all bear with me, okay? It's been good so far. He shares some life-changing parables. And after hearing these parables, those around the table listening would rejoice, but those complaining, standing on those out behind those sitting at the table would be guilty and judgmental and realize they failed in their responsibilities. In this first parable, which we read earlier, sheep is the main focus, specifically uh, the one sheep who is lost. In the Old Testament, uh, sheep were often uh, used as metaphors in referring to the people of Israel and occasionally caused the people of Israel as lost sheep a commentary states this the old testament and i've got this on the back of your bulletin so if you want to follow along there this is good the old testament primarily the psalms polarized people into categories of righteous and wicked Uh, those two categories frame the old testament view of the moral universe in luke a new dichotomy emerges based not on righteousness and wickedness but on lost and found Luke's narrative has prepared us for this new understanding of the nature of the human plight and its solution. People are not wicked or rejected, but they're lost. The righteous are not elect or chosen, but they are found. What does that mean? A sinner who might do wicked things is lost, right? Let's think about that for a moment. People that don't know Christ are considered lost. I know a lot of good people who aren't necessarily wicked that are lost. Right? Good contributions to the community. Awesome people. But they're lost. And they still might do wicked things. But man, a person who comes to know Christ, what are they? They're found. And because they're found and because Christ is doing something new in them, that makes them righteous. That makes them want to do good things, bear good fruit, as it says in Galatians. Amen? And so going back to this metaphor of lost sheep, uh, sheep are lost because of failed leadership. Uh, The the, the shepherds in the Old Testament, the religious teachers and leaders, uh, failed to be the shepherd God commanded them to be. The Pharisees and religious teachers uh, doing the complaining are the very ones who have failed the marginalized. Think about that for a moment, right? The Pharisees, the religious teachers, the very ones who are doing the complaining are the very ones who have failed those around them. If this is true, then if we, the righteous, are doing more complaining than loving, we have failed those around us. That's a hard pill to swallow. If we, the righteous, are doing more complaining, South Louisiana, they call it yeah, yeah, right? If we're doing more of that, then we are loving those around us, no matter where they're at, because God loves them, amen? And we want to help them to see Christ through us and help them see Christ in a new way through love and compassion and grace and mercy, right? If we're doing more complaining than loving, And we fail those around us. So Jesus says, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he have 99 others in the wilderness? Or won't he he leave uh, leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go and search for the one who is lost until he finds it? Ultimately, we know Jesus is the one who seeks the lost sheep. Jesus is the one that leaves the 99, which is safe and secure to pursue the one that is lost. Man, when we were kids, I had a cousin. It seemed like he had a new dog each week. Anybody know somebody like that? It seemed like he had a dog each week. And we, I'd spend the night at his house just about every, every Saturday night, every Friday night. And uh, he'd say, oh, this dog is Scooter, or this dog is Jim Bob, or this dog. He had, he had a three-legged dog one time, and he called him one leg. How funny is that? Anyways, get it? He's a three-legged dog. but he's, Anyways, so. sorry. 
So anyways, uh, there was a couple of times when, when we would come in and I'd say, well, what, what, where's the, the one lost dog? I don't know. Well, let's call him and see if he comes. And eventually the dogs would come back. And so we get this picture of, of Jesus. The, the 99 are safe and secure. Why? Because they've already experienced, or they're experiencing, I should say, the grace and the mercies of God to the fullest. They have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but there's one that hasn't. And somehow that one got away. Somehow that one... Maybe he was aggravated with this one of the 99 that was being, I don't know, ungrateful or battering them with Scripture, whatever word you want to use there. And this one gets away. So what does Jesus do? Y'all stay here. I'll be back in a little while. Talk amongst yourselves. Amen? So he sets out. And when he has found the lost sheep, he would joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. Man, think about that. Think about that imagery for just a moment. Shepherd goes off, finds the lost sheep, puts the sheep on his shoulders, and he comes home. And he doesn't just walk home, right? This, this imagery that we're seeing here, the, the, the original writers, what they were trying to get us to understand is there was this celebration that was happening, right? There was this skipping and jumping and running and excitement over this one lost sheep that is now being brought back into the fold. Our kids that we pray for, our grandkids that we pray for all the time, tell me you're not excited when they come to know Christ. Tell me you wouldn't go crazy if they called you up and said, hey, guess what I just did? I'm found. Would you not too be overwhelmed and jumping up and down and joyful over what just took place? Man, I... This excitement that Jesus that, that, that Jesus is talking about, that, and just imagine Jesus himself jumping up and down. The Pharisees, that would have blew their tops. Dignified people don't do that. Amen? We talked about Wednesday night being undignified. We need to be a little more undignified sometimes. Amen? Be a little more excited about what God is doing in our lives. And when he arrives back home for, with the flock, he will call all his friends and his neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me because I have found this lost sheep. Celebrations, now get this, I don't know if you've realized this or not, celebrations are communal. Celebrations aren't meant to be kept for ourselves. Now there's some things, yes, we celebrate with, with just me and Sierra, our, my spouse, right? There's some things we just celebrate together. But man, majority of our life, celebrations are communal. Weddings. Come on now. Weddings. At the end of our wedding, we were walking down the aisle and we had celebrate good times. Come on, playing. Amen? <laughs> and the church. People were like, oh my gosh, they're playing at the church. And I'm, woo! Amen? Celebrations are communal. Graduations. Amen? Uh, we, watched, we weren't able to go to Grace's graduation. See our sister, she graduated at the end of May. We weren't able to go there because they had COVID. Uh, but they live streamed it. And this little place that the Pelicans play at in Baton Rouge was packed. And by the end of it, there wasn't a dry room in the, in the, in the, in the building. Everybody's crying, oh, my baby's graduated, right? We get excited over these things. Just another example I have here. Baptisms. Amen? That's a communal event. Salvation moments. Those are moments between us and God, yes, but when we stand up and say, the Lord has forgiven me of my sins, the church should erupt. Yes. Not ooh, good for you. It's about time. <laughs> right? If you get this way, you need to go to camp. Amen? Run up and down the aisles and thank God. Right? Celebrations are communal events. And so, yes, when Jesus comes back, he is excited. He is skipping. He's on cloud nine. He is running to the flock saying, look who I have found. Rejoice with me. Mom, put your nice clothes on. Get out of the house. Amen? Sister Susie, get out of the bed. It's time to celebrate. We don't have a Sister Susie in here. That's the reason why I use that name. So anyways... When something good or exciting happens, we want to celebrate. We should celebrate. The concern for one should be a concern for all. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than the other 99 who are doing okay. Amen? 
You get this, right? I'm going to say this again next week, and I'm going to say it again three weeks from now. All of heaven is elated when somebody comes to know Christ as Lord and Savior. Literally, the angels dance and celebrate when one person comes to know Christ. That's awesome. Just think about that for a moment. Just think about that for a moment. God in all his glory, Isaiah gives us a, uh, an awesome description of the splendor of God and his, the tail of his robe going out into the, to the hall, down the, uh, or down the doorway and out the, uh, on the steps and flowing out into the, to the entryway, right? You get this awesome depiction of, of what the temple of God may look like. And then you look in Revelations and you see these other <clears throat> groups of people that are gathered around God. And, and then you also read in Revelations where the angels are singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty uh, what's taking place when someone comes to the altar and say Lord forgive me of my sins when someone is in their car and they say Lord I've messed up forgive me of my sins that changes and everybody erupts and celebrates over one person coming to know Jesus Christ amen what if we did that in the church amen church would look a whole lot different amen be worth waking up to and say well I'm glad I came this morning amen Somebody comes to know Christ, and we, we truly are excited over that. Are the 99 any less important? Absolutely not. They've had their celebration moment. Amen? <laughs> Heaven has rejoiced over them. But this one, whew, they've received this grace and this mercy of God to the fullest. But the one that is lost literally flips heaven upside down and causes rejoicing like we've never seen before. We must understand that as Christ followers, we are called to invite them to the table. Whoever the marginalized is in our family, in our community, in the area around us, we have a responsibility to be a part of their lives. Even if it means going down that street or going to that restaurant or having conversations with that person. Amen? Once we invite them to the table, it's important to share a life-changing story with them. Sure, you can share scripture with them, but how much more impactful would it be if you shared your testimony with them? What God has done in your life. You're telling me about scripture, and you're telling me, and that's important, they need to know that, but what's God done for you? How has God affected you this week? How has God saved you of your sins? And where are you at now? That's a life-changing story. And when they have made the decision to follow Jesus, rejoice with them. If you got to jump up and down so that they know you're excited, dad gummit, jump up and down. Caden, when he's excited, he has a big old smile, but when he's really excited, he starts bouncing. Amen? So we bounce together, right? He stood up the other day, and I was so excited. Evidently, he'd done it before, and I just hadn't seen it. And he pulled his hands away from the little dresser. He looked up at me and just fell right back, right? But man, when he popped his head up, I was, woo, good job, baby boy, right? Let's do it again. Let's do it again. All of the angels and, and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, they all rejoice too. So we should join in them in this rejoicing and the celebration that happens. You would stay.